what do you believe right now that's making you feel this way? And when you analyse it, you realise how irrational you can be at times. Every single one of our major customers and minor customers all shut their doors overnight. It's not sales per se, but the outcome of it is because people get to know you, they get to see you. But, you know, what's the culture like at the business? What do what do we stand for, the values? I've got to tick that box on my personal development programme for the... I don't really want to be here. Scaling up a business isn't easy. If it were, we wouldn't have less than 4% of businesses scaling beyond 10 employees or around a million pound turnover level and less than 1% beyond 50 employees. But the contribution that we make as owner managers to our economies is immense and should never be underestimated. Yet it can be a tough gig for all of us at times. And only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And through Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things a little easier. We interview guests who have been where you are now and may have faced some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked for them, as well as what didn't. And we've also combined many of the lessons from these interviews and also through working with hundreds of owner managers over the last 10 years or so into a practical scale up handbook that we've called the Entrepreneurial Scale Up System or ESAS. And it's for owner managers like you and me as we navigate our own scale up journey. And you can order a copy through your favorite online book retailer or by going to all the W's, esasgroup.co.uk, www esusgroup.co.uk Hello, I'm Granger Forson, www.bizsmart-gloucestershire.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn. This time on Scale Up Radio, I speak with Ben Craig, the MD of InfoSec People. InfoSec People is a recruitment business that specialises in aiding companies in the UK, Europe and the USA in finding key talent in cybersecurity and data privacy from CE levels all the way to developers. They started 15 years ago and are based in Cheltenham. They currently have 20 staff and plan to grow by five more by the end of 2023. It was so interesting hearing Ben's story about how he started with a business as a recruiter working for the owner, Chris Dunning-Walton, when there were just four of them, and now becoming the MD guiding the business through its growth. As always, we cover a lot of ground, including stay true to your values as you hire people, but also find people that add to your culture. Understand your markets and sit tight during the tough times by doing the right things. And use everyone in the business as part of the interview process to check suitability of candidates. What is illuminating about this conversation with Ben is how much he and the business focus on people. As they look to their growth, they wish for their people to stay with them long term and grow into more senior roles along the way. InfoSec People is about growing their people. I know you'll get something out of this episode. So let's go over and listen to Ben. So hello, Ben Craig, InfoSec People. Welcome to Scale Up Radio podcast. Please introduce yourself and your business to us. Yeah, hi, Granger. Thanks for having me. So I'm Ben Craig. I'm the Managing Director of InfoSec People. We are a uh, cybersecurity specialist recruitment company that work with companies across the UK, the US and Europe, placing cybersecurity professionals into in-demand roles. Wow. So very specific type of individuals that you're looking for rather than uh, general um, recruitment processes. So cybersecurity experts, what type of people are you looking for? How do you, how do you find them? How do you, your clients come to you in terms of uh, wanting your services? Yeah, great question. So cybersecurity is a bit of a minefield, as I'm sure you can probably imagine. Uh, the great thing about cybersecurity, of course, is that the more that technology improves and changes and and, and uh, encapsulates the world, uh, the more of a need for securing people's data and information. So typically, the people within our network are chief information security officers. They're typically the people that lead the security functions. 
Uh, we also then place their teams underneath them. So typically we work with companies who are looking for um, professionals that can secure the cloud, uh, that can also uh, work around the sort of data privacy pieces. Uh, that's inclusive of security consultants. Uh, and then you fall down more into the sort of technical security specialists as well. Um, so people in the SOC, uh, Security Operations Center, um, as well as security analysts um, and, and the like as well. So um, we have a, a very strong established network that's been uh you know built upon over the last sort of 15 years um so we get a lot of referrals from that which is great um but equally um some of the markets that we penetrate are big organizations in the FTSE lists that typically are working on exciting projects uh, and need support um but also as well as that we have a huge passion for the startup and scale-up community uh, especially here in Cheltenham so we give advice to those um people who are maybe pre-seed um who need of course to scale their teams to to enhance their offering um and we support them on how to hire and retain highly skilled type of security professionals wow a, a huge range of company size there from FTSE 100 all the way down to small startups and scale-ups uh, in terms of yeah. marketing people so yeah, uh, Peter's busy. Yeah, absolutely. So, give us an, uh, an, 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 you know, how, how many people do you sort of recruit per year? Do you think, you know, what sort of size of your business are you? Yeah, again, great question. So it, it typically varies. So so we work both permanent and interim markets. Um, permanent, I would probably say we make anything between eighty to one hundred and twenty placements per year. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less. And then, of course, on the interim side, that all depends on what projects companies have. Um, at my peak, um, when I was on the tools, as it were, before I became the MD, um, you know, I would I would traditionally place anywhere between sort of thirty and forty five contractors into interim engagements myself a year. There's some big big numbers there in terms of number of people in terms of finding that. So describe just in terms of your business model is in terms of recruitment. So you know, but you specialize in in these types of individuals. So how how do you you know? What, what's your sort of business model? How do you find these people? How do you then, you know, put them into the contracts that, that they're needed? Sure. So, um, so as we know, recruitment is a bit of a swear word uh, in some worlds. It's, uh, you know, our CEO, Chris, a little while ago did a thought piece, which was titled, Don't Say the R Word. Um, and I suppose that probably gives you a really good indication of the uh, the impression of some people that ha- they have on recruiters. Um, I would say typically our model is to, is to, to move away from sort of traditional tropes of recruitment practice, the, you know, the proverbial used car salesperson that opens their jacket and says, you know, do you need somebody or have you got a job I can work? Um, What we like to do is is forge longstanding relationships with clients based upon uh, a solution-based model, should we say. So we typically like to um, engage with um, individuals and organizations that have a particular point of pain but also have the power to enable themselves and their teams to deliver successful projects. So typically what we like to do is go into the uh, technical stakeholders of an organization, get to know them better, understand what challenges they might be facing, um, and work very much in the gray area. So as an example, if, for instance, you said to me, I've just pitched up uh, an organization. Uh, we've got pretty big uh, growth plans. Uh, we're also working on some some new technologies as well. And therefore, my cyber team is going to need um, people. Um, we would typically work with them based upon understanding the challenge around not sourcing those people. Um, and we would then try to find suitable solutions. What we then typically do is like to forge um, relationships with um, HR uh, procurement teams, talent acquisition teams to really understand what what do they look for when they use a talent partner? Because of course that relationship is so important to make sure that everybody's aligned and nobody's fighting against each other. Everybody's got to sort of work in unison um, because ultimately the, the main thing for us is securing a business via the people that they bring in, but also as well as that changing the lives of the people that we place into those organizations. We really want to get uh, you know, do a deep dive to understand what type of person uh, would fit an organization, what sort of culture are they looking for in their next move and ensuring that we're finding them um, somebody that can come in and add value from day one, but equally find them their rising stars and, and future stars of tomorrow. Um, and hopefully if we're able to do that um, properly, uh, the, the end result is a successful placement for somebody that goes on to add value to an organization for years. Yeah, so getting in there, drilling down deep, and then working with all of the stakeholders in in terms of finding the opportunity and really then finding the right candidates for that. Okay, so you 
you, you talk right back at the beginning that you work in the UK, the USA, and and Europe. Do you do you find um, differences with with your your client base depending on the countries that you work in, or are all sort of requirements for cybersecurity the same? Um, I would say that. Realistically, most recruitment requirements that we get are all very, very similar, um, which is I've lost somebody, they've left a gaping hole, please help us fill it, um, or we're working on something brand new, we don't know how we're going to do it, can you help us find people that do? Um, but I would probably say the biggest the biggest differentiating factor between the UK market and, and say the US, for an example, is, is more around the sort of business process that some organizations follow. We know, of course, America loves uh, brave salespeople, should we say, um, but they're also very rigorous in their approach at how they onboard suppliers as well. So typically if we're if we're speaking to a client in America and we've got somebody that can add value and you say, for instance, went to another organization to say, hey, these people over here are looking at this person with a with a with a keen interest. Normally, that would warrant a conversation. I would probably say that the UK has been burnt by very bad practice within the recruitment sector, to be honest, and therefore their arms are up a little bit more, a bit more guarded, um, and they really want to understand how you intend to work with the business and fee structures and how compliant are you um, because. Let's face it, again, I touched on it earlier, the, the the old trope of used car salespeople into recruitment. They normally come in, offer a lot, promise a lot and deliver nothing. So therefore, every time that happens, regardless of whether you're looking for a cybersecurity professional, a finance professional, or, or maybe even a, a cook, as it were, for, for your on-site kitchens, people remember those times where they were let down by people that promised the world. So it's really important for us to sort of recognize that. And, and at the same time, some people have existing relationships with recruitment uh, companies that are really strong. And therefore, you know, we're happy to be the spare tire if ever needed. But at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that with with what we do and the people that we work with, um, they are could be the differentiator between a company being successful within their within their cyber teams or getting breached. And I think as we see it more in the news, um, it's a lot more relevant. People are speaking about it a lot more, but there's also a lot more inhibiting factors to the individuals at the top. If things go wrong in their reputation within the industry, um, I think that it's really key that companies can sort of forge strong relationships with recruitment partners because equally we're all, we're all reaching for the same thing in this industry and that's to make sure that companies um, are protected and of course the data of their customer base is protected as well. So thinking about then the, your your clients in the marketplace, you know, does is it becoming harder to find the types of individuals that you're recruiting in terms of cyber experts? Um, you know, what, what's sort of going on in the marketplace? Are, are more clients wanting it? You know, how many specialisms businesses like yourself exist? You know, so what? tell us about the marketplace. Yeah, sure. So the marketplace is very buoyant at the moment, uh, which is great, um, of course. And we're seeing a lot more focus around STEM subjects and actually bringing through um, tomorrow's generation of cybersecurity professionals, which is which is brilliant. I would say that there is a, a perceived viewpoint that actually there is a cybersecurity skills gap at the moment. And don't get me wrong, in some cases that is true. Um, I would also say, though, that um, some companies and some security leaders are really focusing on how they can upscale and train their existing team, move people over from maybe infrastructure and networks or their tech teams into the cyber function and really give them um, their their, their focus to, to to sort of train from within. I would also say there's some excellent um, organizations as well um, that are focusing on upskilling and training people out of industry and bringing them through and then feeding them into uh, organizations, of course, that take on apprentices uh, and, and late learners. Um, I, I would say that there is an ability for us to work better, um, to, to change how we how we place people into organizations looking for cybersecurity professionals. And that's something that's really key to us. And also, as well as that, sort of looking at the sort of diversity and inclusivity of people's hiring processes. A big one for me is social economic diversity. So it's about enabling people from social um, economic um, uh, backgrounds uh, that perhaps didn't go to university, weren't gifted um 
from a, from an educational standpoint that have worked really hard to forge a, a, a fledgling career within the industry and they can actually go through uh, and get put into really great jobs where they can kind of forge their own path and that's key for me so I think there's a lot to be done I think there's a lot of work being done which is the exciting part um, there's a few there's a few tweaks that we could possibly make um, but I would say the future is looking really bright in this industry. Brilliant. Well, that's a really good understanding. And, and I love the, your, your attention in terms of social economic diversity focus, you know, and bringing the opportunities to, to people that maybe thought they didn't have that opportunity in the past, but that, that definitely exists. So and we understand the business. How, how, how big are you in terms of employees? Yeah, so we currently are split between two offices. Um, we've got just under 20 people at the moment, um, uh, but we're looking to grow. We have uh, solid solid growth plans for this year. Now, I'd like to think by the end of this financial year, we'll have uh, no less than 25 people in the organisation. Nice growth opportunity there in terms of what you're trying to do. Brilliant. So you definitely said that the marketplace was buoyant and uh, can support that. that. That's awesome to hear. So let's go back to the, to the beginning now in terms of... Um, infosec people you know why did it start how did it start what was that what was that uh, aha moment when things got going yeah so the company was founded by our our uh, current CEO Chris Dunning Walton. Uh, he founded the organization um, just after the recession. His focus was around placing class consultants coming out of the big central building in Cheltenham into organizations. They were, uh, yeah, as I said, called class consultants. Uh, and he really found a niche in that. Um, you know, since then, uh, the company grew. It was just him in his bedroom. And then I remember him telling me stories about renting offices from companies that had just a spare desk in the corner. Um, and then it grew into a small office here in Eagle Tower in Cheltenham. I joined the business back in well, 2016, 2017 now as a, just a junior recruitment consultant and there were me plus four um, in, a, in a smaller office. Uh, we now have a much larger office uh, on a higher floor, better views. Um, and and yeah, we've got uh, the second second location here in Bristol as well. So it's it's grown considerably since Chris's vision back in, or you know, all those years ago. Um, and one of the things that we're really sort of keen, uh, and I'm very keen to do as the as the managing director, is to keep Chris's uh, values um, because they were very strong, um, and he was always big on do the right thing. Um, so, so that's what we sort of aim to do moving forward as well. So, since since you've been involved and and taken over the MD role, any any you know any advice you've you get what what what's gone right, what's gone wrong, you know, some thoughts there. So, I, I would probably say from a from a business perspective is to stay true to your values. Look at what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, equally, at the same time, you need to understand what type of markets you feel are likely to need our services um, and value us as a as a partner i would also say if things um look as though they might not be going to plan you know buckle up sit tight uh, and ensure of course that you you continue to do the right things it's very easy when things look a bit gray to then act out of almost necessity really and that can sometimes promote bad behaviors um, but the, the, the main thing is as well is is ensuring that your staff feel empowered um, to work for the business and that they come into the work knowing that they've got a good support mechanism around them, whether you're a leader or whether you're a peer. Um, everybody should be singing off the same hymn sheet and every should, everybody should be, feel part of the mission um, and be looking to sort of deliver that change for the organization, but equally um, for their own personal aspirations as well. Um, I'm a big believer of that. So you've you've been recruiting and you know, you've got twenty staff now looking for another five. So you know how do you recruit? How do you ensure you've got the right people coming into your your business um, to be successful for the, your plans and also you know taking the business forwards? Yeah, great question, and it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have made mistakes, uh, I must admit, um, but. I think, again, it goes, I mentioned this a few times, uh, there needs to be that cultural and value alignment. Um, again, there's a very low barrier for entry in the recruitment industry, which possibly is why some companies have such a bad reputation. So it's about understanding, will this individual come in and uphold the moral standpoint of why the organization's here and what we're looking to, to do, um, and the sort of reputation we're looking to establish with new relationships as well. 
Um, but equally then at the same time, we want to make sure that we're outreaching to people who fundamentally want to be different, want something more um, and, and really kind of get to grips with what that looks like for them individually. So that's the first thing. Um, from an outreach perspective, I've got quite a good established network of recruiters, probably across the UK. Um, of course, for future, you know, future there's sort of aspirational growth potentially. There could be uh, more opportunities in different locations at some point. Um, but then it's just really just staying in contact with them. Um, I suppose everybody wants something now. I want to hire somebody that's doing the job that I'm doing now, ideally for a competitor and knows the clients that I know realistically that tends to not happen um so i like to build relationships with you know recruitment com- uh, consultants sales people or even people out of industry uh, and just look for the opportune time really where where things are lying where we can sort of bring them into info set people on board them give them the relevant training and get them going um but again the first and foremost they have to have that that value alignment to us as a business because we would never jeopardize our reputation in the market um, just for the sake of somebody that's a really good salesperson. And, and a lot, a lot of business owners, you know, talk about um, you know this values alignment. Uh, I, I'm interested because we're talking to a r- recruiter and your experience of doing that, and also now the recruitment of people into your business to do that. Mm. How how do you go about creating that? value alignment review within a within a you know an interview and onboarding process you've got your values and then you've got the culture so typically when we look to hire you know we're not looking for people that conform to our cultural beliefs we're actually looking for people that can bring a cultural act um you know touch on diversity and inclusivity earlier so that could be as i said you know social economic uh, diverse diversity it could be neurodiversity it could be whatever um that adds to the culture and and enables us to grow as a team really but scraping it back to values i suppose what we really need to um get out in the open in in the organization is what are our values right And, and how do we live and breathe them when we're interviewing people there are a certain set of questions that we typically ask um to understand that um, we also, as well as that, um, when when we get sort of nearer to the sort of uh, you know the crux of the of the process, normally three three stage interview here. On the third stage, we'll get people from different teams in the organisation to almost kind of have a fireside chat with the with the potential hire, really just to get them to ask our panel and our current colleagues any questions they might have, but it also gives them the opportunity and we, and we do it from different people. So it's not just salespeople that will ask the, 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 the interviewer either questions. It will be somebody from finance, maybe somebody from marketing, somebody from operations, somebody from delivery, um, somebody from sales. And they'll just ask some different questions um, to really get to grips with whether this person wants to work in an environment where values are P1 for us. And if we, get together at the end of the session and find out actually they might be brilliant from a, from a revenue generation perspective, but actually their values are slightly more, Hey, I'm just here to sell and make money. They won't come in because I would much rather have a team of people, you know, delivering to a good level um, than an absolute outlier, but maybe just doesn't, doesn't align with us. Brilliant. I, I, I love that um, comment in terms of bringing in people that uh, are cultural adders. They actually add to your your culture uh, over time uh, and expand it, not just fitting into it uh, in terms of that. I, I, I love that. And uh, I like your description of a fireside chat um, yeah. with, with the other individuals in, in the business. That, that That's awesome. I, lo- I love that. I can uh, really just see that as a description and how it works. So, so your b- business is growing. Um, successfully in terms of what you're doing and achieving. So how do you, uh, as a business, keep keep a focus on the right things that need to be done? Yeah, I suppose there's so many different areas we could cover there. I suppose we need to stick to, to within the recruitment sense, of course, is, um, you know, the right things for us are revenue generation. It's about our... our uh, ability to hire good people internally but then it's also around the outreach to our to our market and to our industry so what value are we giving back without the expectation of any sort of revenue generation so that could be sponsorship for events that could be delivering um 
power plays for you know perfect example of for uh, a big retailer a uh, well-known brand they were really struggling uh, with their hiring um, but they had a, a recruitment freeze on from external support i spoke with their head of talent who said i just don't know how we're going to do this it's it's a real headache for us and it's going to cost the team and it could damage us reputationally so what we did um, was we arranged a session for about two hours where one of my colleagues, a really good chap called James Gallen, um, he delivered a training session to an internal recruitment team on actually how to hire um, cybersecurity people as a TA. Um, they managed to then hire three people through their own channels. Uh, which was something that we didn't get paid for. We didn't want to get paid for. Um, all we wanted was just to know that we we, we met, left a positive mark on an organization that was struggling. So we like to do things like that as well. Um, and that's normally one of our focuses. But then it's also as well as that, how we can look back into giving to good causes. So last year we donated some of our um, some of our um, profits to um, the the awful goings on in Ukraine. Um, so we're, we're we're big on that as well. Brilliant. And another really important part of a business as it grows is 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 cash and ensuring that the cash is uh, flowing through the business. How do you as a business manage and keep an eye on control on cash? Yeah, of course. And again, for us, it's, it's it's the easiest, hardest thing to project, really. More deals equals more cash. And, you know, there's an old saying, which I'm sure you probably know, Granger, which is, of course, cash is king. Um, so we've got a, a, a very... Um, She's incredible. Our, our head of finance, Karen Olson Ramsworth, she's been here now for five years. She very much keeps an eye on cash flow. We then look at that on a quarterly basis to understand what our projected revenues are for that quarter. And then that decides um, what we're looking to you know, spend our money on for that quarter. So we like to break it down into quarterly chunks. We then reassess things half yearly. And of course, we have regular finance reviews as well to understand how, how we're looking and how we're shaping up. That then, of course... Um, defines our our plan for the following quarter really uh, if we're doing well keep doing that look at how we can um sort of build upon the revenue generation and splinter off into different areas that of course earns money if we're not doing so well for a particular quarter actually do, do we need to spend money here there for for that period of time and and if the answer is no then then we don't do it um so so yeah we're we're, we're very on top of it we've been profitable now nearly well pretty much every year um we've hit a couple of records um you know throughout the pandemic was actually one of our most profitable years um and and equally at the same time we make sure that our profit doesn't um overrule our decisions to reward the team because equally they're the ones that make us the profit love that and um, and as a business grows your marketing strategies have to become more robust and they evolve and change just interested you know how, how is how is what marketing works for you and what how has it evolved over the the, the years yeah so uh marketing is headed up by uh, a great a great girl called harriet walker um we regularly look at what what is it that we're feeding into our our listeners, our our fans. Um, so it's all about understanding what marketing collateral or what marketing thought pieces target certain markets. I had a chief information security officer um, deliver a training session um, to our team a little while ago, and he said, what is it you're putting out there that talks to people like me? And I think that's the main question. So it's actually, it's really important for us to understand who our target, target audience are, typically what their um, challenges might be. And then, of course, what we then do um, is we work with people, uh, industry peers, uh, leaders to create thought pieces that are relevant to them. So one of which is an example is how to hire and retain highly skilled cybersecurity professionals. Um, another one uh, which we've put out recently is how AI can support your organization rather than inhibit it. Um, and we, we share those through LinkedIn newsletters, but we also, as well as that, we do, we go to regular events and, and share these bits of knowledge. And that enables us then to create thought leaders within the industry that want to work with InfoSec people to project out their thoughts. And I think that's key. If you can really pinpoint who it is you're trying to reach and what it is you're trying to say, I do believe that you generate fans of the organization. And then what you'll find is it creates an echo chamber where they'll want to start adding into it as well. And that's kind of the 
the best place to be where you've got people that are more knowledgeable about a subject than you are uh, that have been doing it for years coming to you saying hey i think this is really cool i'd like to talk about it through your channels can i do that um and we're, we're really passionate about that in our marketing team brilliant I, I like that very much and becoming that that thought leader in terms of doing that you you mentioned ai there in terms of just a, a piece you did recently you know do do you see any sort of you know medium term impact in terms of ai on the on the, on the cyber security sector or is it actually going to accelerate it because you'll need more people to protect it yeah both i think it's uh it's the most exciting scary thing i think i've ever i've ever looked into and don't get me wrong you can go down a few rabbit holes with it uh, so try not to do that um but yeah i think it could be a huge enabler equally as with everything there's always an element of um uh cynicism should we say uh and rightly so in some cases and i think the the, the great thing about cybersecurity is there's really intelligent people um out there that are working on making sure that um you know tools like ai can be a great thing rather than a bad thing um but equally at the same time you'll hear a lot of um press and thought pieces around why it's bad but actually to understand why it's bad, that enables us to use it for what it's good at. Um, so yeah, I think we're already seeing that. There's lots of organizations, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily think of that are using it already and have been for quite some time. Uh, and I think as it, as, as, it, as it establishes itself further and grows more, of course, we'll see a new cybersecurity role that doesn't even exist yet, that literally just focuses on that, which is why I love working in this industry. Brilliant. Um, a, a question for you, rather than specifically the business. You know, one one of the things you know you're, you're an MD in terms of grow in a growing business. How do you manage? You know, not to get overwhelmed by it all. Uh, you know, what 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 tools, what techniques, what what do you do to do that? Yeah, great. Yeah, <laughs> great question. It's hard, of course. Um, you know, there are nights, of course, I'm sure, of every MD or business owner where you kind of wake up at three o'clock in the morning unsure as to why you've done it uh, and then can't get back to sleep. But um, I would say I've got a really supportive team around me, um, which is very important, down from my leadership team to even some of the new starters, uh, which is great. I've got a, a wonderful fiance um, and two wonderful boys. So if I find, you know, if I need to defrag, then I'll, I'll just spend time with them. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, I like going for walks and listening to podcasts or self-improvement um, audibles. Um, and I also, as well as that, like to spend time on my fitness as well. I, uh, you know, I tend to find actually some of my best ideas come from when I'm going for a run or something like that. I'm a big believer of, you know, exercise is, is key to sort of um, releasing positive endorphins and that can enable you to be successful when you're at work and sort of have that clear separation between I'm in work mode and I'm actually in in bend mode uh, as I call it and uh, it, it's clear to it's good to have that separation because you can't be good at home if you're not good at work you can't be good at work if you're not good at home and sometimes you don't want the two sort of bleeding into the other yes I like that terminology the separation so uh, work mode versus bend mode so um, what do you love most about about the business the people for sure the people and that and whether that's the people i work with or the people that i i you know work for or, or work yeah or we sort of work for it's a it's a very, it's a it's a people driven industry and you know i've got a great team around me that make me laugh you know uh, inspire me to be better on a daily weekly monthly basis and then also as well as that the clients and and people that we find roles for they're just brilliant um and i think without the people there isn't a business let's let's think about just the industry so what what drives you crazy about the industry and if i gave you a magic wand what would you change with that magic wand uh a great question there's, uh there's a few uh depends who's listening to what i say um I would probably say the the skepticism around bringing in people that don't tick every box on paper. Um, and I know that, of course, that's coming from a very, um, you know, personally driven angle, um, of course. But I think it falls back to what I said about hiring for my own team. Everybody's looking for somebody that's doing it, doing it now and ideally doing it for a competitor 
where I think there's so many great people out there that are just looking for their opportunity and, and keep on getting stonewalled probably at the first entry because their CV maybe doesn't add up, but they might not be great at writing CVs, right? So it's um, so probably that. I think if I could wave my magic wand, I would probably create more of an open dialogue between organizations and the people that are trying to work for them. Uh, and I also think, uh, again, if I had this, my second magic wand or three wishes, I would probably look at, how we can work with one another, un, another, sorry, to enable the industry rather than inhibit it. Whether you're a salesperson, a cybersecurity professional, somebody working in procurement for an organization, we should all be working together. And I think if we could create that period of harmony, I think actually uh, we would find that practices would improve and everybody would get what they want. Um, because I don't think there's anything wrong with necessarily selling a service into an organization or selling a person into an organization. And it would be nice maybe to have a little bit of the cynicism taken away around, Hey, we've never spoken. Why do you want to speak with me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's inspiring in terms of, and one of my favorite phrases that I've used throughout all my, most of my career is this concept of growing people. Uh, you know, if if you inspire people, give them the environment to grow, they they will excel at whatever you ask them to achieve. Most most people that have a very defined skill set can be quite blinkered, but uh, if you grow and develop people, they they can be very successful for you. So yeah, uh, absolutely, I love that brilliant. Well. Ben, we've we've had an amazing conversation in, so far in terms of uh, all your your thoughts and uh, and uh, feedback on the business. So, where where do, where where are you going to be in five years' time? So, you know, if we were to meet in five years' time and uh, look back over the last five years, what's what's happened both professionally uh, in the business and personally for you to say the last five years have been a real success? Yeah. Um... I would probably say if we were to look back in five years, the 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 main one for me would be to have InfoSec people seen as the the premier recruitment company for cybersecurity across the UK for sure. And ideally um Europe and the US. That you know, they don't they, they call InfoSec people if they need help. Of course that then has many, many different spin-offs with regards to new offices, revenue generation and things like that. I would probably say the most important thing is that the team of people that I've got now, they're all still here in more senior roles and feel personally and professionally fulfilled. And I would also, as well as that, from a business perspective, like to have a reputation of somebody or a business, sorry, that cares about the people that it works for. And I know that's probably a bit kumbaya moment, but I think that's really important. I just want us to be known as the business that cares, the business that delivers results and the team that work here are seeing the fruits of their hard work and are still just as engaged as they are today. I'm proud of, to work for InfoSec people. Um, from a personal perspective, I've got two young boys. Uh, one's about to uh, you know, turn two next month and I've got a six month old. Um, I'm engaged, so I, you know, I can't not say married, of course. Uh, so I love to get married. Um, and again, I would just love to have two happy little boys that feel that their dad loves them and will do anything to make sure that they're that they're happy and cared for. Really, to be honest, uh, you could take away all the money in the world. I just want those two boys to be happy. Well, Ben, thank you very much. You know, our conversation, you know, we talked about infosec people and uh, the difference in terms of your client base uh, and across the world and the differences there. We've talked about, you know, working with FTSE 100 all the way down to small startups and scale ups. Um, you know, the the amount of work that you're doing to to grow and develop the business finding the way that you find both holes in companies because people have less, but also really trying to inspire them to really think about, you know, taking on people that can help you do something new and help to grow and develop a business. I loved your your thoughts on, you know, the social, economical and, and diversity focus in terms of getting people into businesses to, to really grow their skill sets because maybe they didn't have that chance in, in their early days of their, their careers. And being understanding how to grow a business, you've really talked about the ability to demonstrate values and finding people to fit those values, finding that 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 right cultural fit, and growing and developing your people. And uh, you know that that beautiful comment you made in terms of you know bringing people um, 
in that can add to your culture, not just um, fit your culture in terms of doing that. And, and and your wonderful statement there at the end in terms of, you know, um, in five years' time, your, your people are still with you. They're still growing and developing themselves uh, and, and being, you know, a business that cares as well as delivers results. You know, a fantastic conversation. We always finish with a, a quick fire round. So if I may, I've got a few questions just to finish us off. Uh, and my audience will know what these are. But uh, here we go. Um, if you were to go back to your younger you, what advice would you give yourself? Believe in yourself. Excellent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which which books would you recommend? I uh, definitely recommend The Leader Eats Last by Simon Sinek. Um, I'm also a huge fan of how to make friends and influence people in the digital age. Um, but then also as well as that, a- any book really that um, that resonates with the mind uh, and that puts people at ease around what it is they're trying to do. Brilliant, thank you. Which podcast do you listen to and recommend? Uh, quite a few, actually. Depends. I would say, uh, you know, you don't want to know about my my sports team podcast, but you know, um, Mr. Bartlett, of course, um, he's doing some excellent things at the moment, and and you know, his his diverse um, pool of, of of speakers, I think, just blows my mind. Um, so I'd probably say that's the main one. There's a few um, recruitment related ones as well, um, but I'd probably say. Uh, of course, Mr. Bartlett's the main one that I'm listening to at the moment and getting the most value from. Thank you. And on your mobile phone, what apps make the biggest difference for you? Um, uh, in in a business sense, of course, LinkedIn. Um, there's also a, a, a mindfulness app that I've got. Um, there's also, uh, you know, really um, great applications such as, you know, chat, chat gpt of course we mentioned ai earlier which you know i'll ask it a question of how to approach a certain scenario in the business sense and it will quite quickly uh, give me an answer uh, and then another great app i'm using at the moment for my garden is i can take a photo of any flower and it'll tell me what it is and how to care for it because i'm not very good at that <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe i need to get hold of that one uh, for my partner she's uh, that's a <laughs> Um, and my my favourite question of all. So, um, who's had the most influence on you as a business leader? Um, great question. Uh, my CEO Chris Dunning Walton. Um, his viewpoint on life and business is like nothing I've ever seen before. He took a probably a big gamble on me uh, when I joined, um, and throughout the light, the lows and the highs. He's always stuck by my side and and given me opportunities that I would have never believed were possible. Um, and he does it nine times out of ten with a big smile on his face. And yeah, I, I wouldn't be here today without him. Brilliant. Um, what's your most successful marketing tactic or lead generation tactic? Um, speak uh, marketing tactic great oh, that's a good question uh, the best marketing tactic I touched on it earlier find out who your audience are and figure out what it is that you can project out that speaks to them um, from a lead generation perspective um, of course we work in recruitment um, so for me I would probably and I hate this word um, I think we need to ban it but it's candidates speak with as many candidates as you can because they're the ones that will give you everything basically you can forge the relationships with them you can build trust you can support them in what it is they're trying to do and they'll nine times out of ten if you do a good job with that they'll take you along the way with them brilliant thank you ben and finally how can people get hold of you yeah it's great so i'm contactable by linkedin um but benjamin craig on linkedin my email address is ben at infosec people uh, or i'm contactable via my mobile which is uh 07 Brilliant. Ben, thank you very much for this conversation. It has been awesome. Um, I can really see how, you know, living to values and building a, a business that's been supported by by um, Chris in terms of, you know, him as the CEO and helping you do that has allowed you to generate the business that's support around you. So it's been a fantastic conversation today. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Granger. I hope you enjoyed that. 
discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.